Thank everybody you. here. All that right, awesome. that it is great to have everybody here. It's great to see Sandrine and Paya in, in Brooklyn. It's great to have our in-person crew. And then we have Mark coming in as well to join us. Just buzz them in from downstairs. All right, so today we are starting a brand new Torah portion called Nitzavim. Now Nitzavim is one of the final portions of the Torah. It's in Deuteronomy. And we know what's going on just to reset the room. Always, always do this, you know, every day or at least every week where, Deuteron where we explain that Deuteronomy is the final message, Moses' final message to his people. And um, this is it. We're getting close to the end, so to speak, the end of, uh, of the Torah, the five books of Moses, but also the end of the life of Moses in this physical world. Hey, Mark, we got you covered over here. Welcome, welcome. So I'm going to read. The, we're going to do the first two readings today. I will tell you straight off the bat, the first two readings have three verses each. They're very short, but they're very rich in content. So um, we're going to explore them. And uh, uh, we're going to glean, please God glean some insight from them. Okay. Um, need seven. Let's pull it up here on the screen. For those joining on Zoom. Okay, here we go. Torah reading for Nitzavim. Reading one is for Sunday. Reading two is for Monday. But as we are starting the week with DPP and PG Parsha, we're going to be starting from reading number one. At them, Nitzavim Hayom, the Torah says, Moses says to the people, you are standing this day before the Lord, your God, the leaders of your tribes, the elders and your officers, every man of Israel, your young children, your women and your comfort who is within your camp, both your woodcutters and your water drawers. Okay, those are the first two verses. And essentially what Moses is saying is, that you all, referring to the people, you all, or y'all, right, are all standing here today before God. And everyone is, oh, you, you got your own? Awesome. And everyone is standing here together before, before Hashem. And he mentions, he enumerates different types of people. He talks about Roshechem, Shiftechem, the leaders of your tribe, Ziknechem, your elders, Shetrechem, your officers. Tapchem, Neshechem, Vegechem, everything. He goes, he runs the gamut of, of the of different types of people until he gets Mechaitiv Eitzecha Atrev Mimecha from your, your woodcut to your woodcutters and your water drawers or water carriers. And what he's trying to express is that ultimately we all stand together. And ultimately we all need to stand together. You see, often and often in life we let the various um, classifications of human beings get in the way of unity, get in the way of, uh, of a sense of, of oneness. And before his passing, he's gathering the people and he says, every, every single one of you, from the leaders to the woodshoppers, everyone is standing equally before God today. The question really is, you know, in life, when, when do we get this message? You know, when, at what age does this message kick in? The message that our labels don't really divide us or differentiate us, right? That this idea that we're really all one, we're just human beings sharing this planet, human beings that come from God. Oftentimes, not oftentimes, I mean, most of the time we're letting our labels get in the way. Well, I'm this and you're that and I do this and do that. And so I hang out with these types of people and you hang out with those types of people. And therefore, you know, we don't share the same circles. At them, Nitzavim, you're all standing here before God, says Moses. In other words, what's the message before his passing? His message is, you're all one. You're all the same. Yes, you may do different things. You may have different responsibilities in life or, with, or, or in work. But at the end of the day, ultimately, at them, Nitzavim, Hayom, Kuchem, Lefnei Hashem, Lekechem. When you stand before God, you all stand equally. We all stand equal before God. Maybe before, you know, um, the, the, the IRS, we have different labels. Like 
oh, this person is an accountant, and this person is uh, this, and this person is that. Okay, fine. So standing before human beings, maybe there's distinction. But standing before God, we're all the same. At them, mayom kuchem So this is, this is one of those verses, these few verses, that really express the notion of human unity and Jewish unity and oneness, the idea of not creating divisions between us. And it opens up a lot of conversation in Jewish philosophy and in Jewish mysticism Hasidic, and, and Hasidic teachings about the nature of unity. How is it that different people are really or can really feel as one? And there are different ways, different ways in which you can understand this. You know, on a basic level, you can say that unity is born of the fact that we all need each other, right? So, you know, I need even the person who has, you know, uh, the, the billionaire still needs, still, still has needs, right? Needs, I don't know, you need stuff. You need people to help. You need to buy things and someone has to make the stuff that you buy. So even the person that, quote unquote, we would think that has it all and has all the money in the world, sure, but still needs, still has a need up for other people. So at the end of the day, everyone needs someone. Everyone needs more than just someone. Everyone needs, we all need each other. It's on a basic level. On another level, we can say that everyone complements each other. Not only do we need each other, but we all complement each other. So for example, not like, oh, nice tie. That's a different type of compliment. What I mean by compliment is we all help each other in the sense that we complete each other. So for example, look at the human body and we, we look at the human body and realize that, that the body is comprised of multiple limbs. You have the head on top, you have the foot, the feet at the bottom, and in between you have all sorts of limbs and organs and, and a whole, uh, according, to our, according to Judaism at least, I'm not, I'm not a doctor, I just play one on TV, not even, but according to Judaism, there's, there are 248 limbs. Again, I can't, I can't speak uh, from a a medical uh, perspective, but there are 248 limbs of the body and 365 different arteries, veins, types of capillary channels. And, uh, and that comprises the body. So the body is comprised of, two, by the way, 248 limbs plus 365 arteries equals 613. It says that every mitzvah corresponds to one part of the body. That's what it says. This is a classic Jewish teaching. So what's the point? The point is that there's a lot of pieces of the body, right? It's a puzzle comprised of 613 pieces. So the question is, how important is any individual piece? So you might say, look, the head is really important. The toe, the little toe, not as important. So on one level, you could say that. You could say that without the head, a person can't live. But without a, without a toe, God forbid, obviously, you could still live. But here's the question. Mitzat Shlemus, from a perspective of wholeness, right? From, a, from, 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 the, from, the, from the vantage point of a whole body, there's no difference between a head and a toe. A head, without a head, the body's not whole. Without a toe, the body's not whole. So there are different ways to look at the value of the individual part. But when we look at, when we look at a body as a whole unit, as having a, 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 um, the integrity of, of, of the body is when all the pieces are there. So then we can understand how important, if we apply this idea, if we apply this, um, this, uh, this perspective to, to you and I, we recognize that every one of us is important. So you say, well, they're just a woodcutter or water drawer. Just a woodcutter or water drawer? What do you mean? They're a person part of the community, part of the Jewish people, part of the global community, every individual is, is part of that, of, of, that, of that larger unit. And without it, the entire unit is missing. So that's a deeper level of understanding unity, Jewish unity, human unity, etc. If you go even deeper, we look at the soul. And we say that when it comes to souls, everyone is truly equal. Because all of the other stuff, if you're a leader or an elder or you know, this, that, or the other, or a wood chopper and a water carrier. All of those things are what the body does. But if you look at the soul, who is the soul? What is the soul? A piece of God. So there's a piece of God in me, a piece of God in you, a piece of God in Yankel, a piece of God in Shmerel. We're adding Shmerel. Who's this Yankel guy, right? A piece of God in Shmerel. I'm adding Shmerel to the mix. Everyone has a piece of God. 
And, and, and here's the question when it comes to God. Is one piece of God different than the other piece of God? And the answer is, of course, no. It's all equally a piece of God. And so what Moses is trying to evoke in his final, this is really kind of like the final speech. In his final speech to the Jewish people is, y'all are the same. Don't let the distinctions of what you do get in the way of recognizing that you're all the same. Stop fighting, right? Stop like judging. Stop feeling better than the other because you do something differently, you know, from between, nine, between the hours of nine, nine and five. That doesn't make you different. That just gives you a different day job. Doesn't fundamentally change the DNA. The DNA of a human being, the DNA of a Jew specifically, is a Jewish soul. Every person, the DNA is a piece of God. And so let's not let, let us not let those distinctions of body get in the way of similarity. It's not only similarity, oneness of soul. The truth is, what I'm telling you now is essentially the whole 32nd chapter of the book of Tanya. The book of Tanya originally was written with 52 chapters, not 53. And the Alter Rebbe added an, uh, before it was published, he added another chapter. Not to the end, not to the beginning, to the middle, chapter 32. If you know something about, about Jewish numerology, you'll know, I'm just going to stop sharing so I can see you all. So if you know something about Hebrew numerology, gematria, so, so 32 is Lamed Bet, which is heart. Lamed Bet is 32. Lamed is 30. Bet is 2. Lamed Bet is 32. But it spells the word Lev. Lev means heart. And the way we understand this is that this new chapter that was added by the, by, the, by, the, um, by, the, by the author, this new chapter that was added at the end, chapter 32, is not just another chapter or an appendix. It's a different part. It's not the appendix. It's the heart. There's a joke, right? It's appendix you can take out, but a heart needs to stay in. A heart is the heart of the, uh, of, of the matter. And what's the heart of Tanya? Parak Lamed Bey says... That when a person realizes that the body is not that important and the soul is the primary, most important thing. Because that's really one of the keys of Judaism, Kabbalah, Hasidic philosophy, the book of Tanya. It's about recognizing that we have a body. We have a soul. And the most important thing is the fact that we have a soul. The body, okay, yes. The body is the spacesuit. But the main thing is the astronaut. The astronaut can't function in outer space without a space suit. Because you put a human being, yeah, shoot him into outer space, him or her into outer space, without any protection, not going to make it. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, that's, that's not a good It's not a good thing. So what do you do? You put, the, you put the astronaut in a space capsule, in a rocket, whatever it is, and then if they venture out, they have a space suit in order to, to be able to operate. So God takes a soul a pure spiritual soul, a piece of God, and hurls it, right? Chucks it, as we used to say as a kid, right? Throws it into this world. Soul can't survive in this world. It's like too, it's too, I don't know, toxic, materialistic, whatever it is. The soul can't, pure soul can't survive in this world. So it needs a spacesuit. That's the body. But once we know that, we realize that there's the astronaut and the spacesuit, and they're not the same. There's, you would never say, who was the guy that said, um, Neil Armstrong? Was that the guy, the, the astronaut who said, a giant step, a leap? Step, 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 step. Right, okay, yeah. So, so Neil Armstrong. No one would ever say, you know who, you know who took that first walk on the moon? A spacesuit. No one would ever say that. Say Neil Armstrong. I it, he was operating within a spacesuit. Okay, but he it's him. It's not it's not, not the spacesuit on its own. For, but for some reason, we, we find it difficult to wrap our heads around the fact that we are literally the same construct. We have a soul that is who we are, and then there's a body, which is a space. And for some reason, we think that the body is who we are, and the soul. I don't know. Who knows what that is? A soul, <laughs> whatever. That's, that's how we think about ourselves and about the other person. So the, the entire, the enti I can't say the entirety of, but a big piece 
of the book of Tanya is for us to remember, is to remind ourselves that we have a godly soul. We have an animal soul. We have a body. They're not the same thing. But who are we at our core? A godly soul operating within and sometimes against the animal soul and the body. There's a struggle. There's tension. There's a wrestling match. We're trying to do our best to avoid the temptations of the animal soul and the body and, and to persevere. But who are we when we identify? Right? Today is all about identification. What do we identify as? Who do we identify? Let's identify as a godly soul that also happens to have a body and an animal soul. That's the main thing. So chapter 32, again, a standalone chapter added after everything else was written, wedged right in there in the heart of Tanya. And what does it say? When a person knows, not just here, but here in the heart, when a person gets, really gets the fact that they are, instead of speaking third person, when I really get the fact that I am a godly soul that happens to also have a body, when I see myself or know myself as such, that is the only way that I can fulfill the mitzvah of Yahafta, Lareacha, Kamocha, love your fellows yourself. Because as long as I see myself as a body, then I will see myself as defined by my physical, um, what's the word I'm looking at? Manifestation. I was going to say avatar, like the way I look and what I, you know, like the physical stuff, as long as I, as long as I identify by my physical manifestation, I'll identify you by your physical manifestation. And those are not going to be the same. And sometimes they'll be a little compatible. Sometimes they'll be completely different. And then we'll have nothing in common because this is my physical avatar. That's your physical avatar. And they're not compatible. But when we realize that we are not a physical manifestation, but or that doesn't define us. We are at our core, a spiritual soul, a piece of God. And you know what the other guy is? Also a piece of God. That means that you and I are not just compatible. We're essentially, literally the same, identical. We identically have the same piece of God inside of us. And, 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 and to this was the great dialogue in the Talmud of all places, discussing this mystical idea. The Talmud discusses. There was once a Roman philosopher who asked, I think it was Rabbi Akiva, how is it that you claim, you Jews claim, that everybody has a piece of God? How many gods are there? So the rabbi answered him, listen to this, because you might be thinking, if I have a piece of God and you have a piece of God, oy, you put God through the, the, blend, the shredder? That's like, you know, the pasta machine that oozes out different strands of, like what? There's a, like a little strain of... The rabbi answered the Roman office, the Roman philosopher, he said, um... Does the sun shine into your house? Yeah. Into my house? Yeah. Through the windows? How many suns are there? Right? I have sun in my house, sunlight in my house, the sunlight in your house. So how many suns are there? Same sun. I have a piece of the sun. You have a piece of the sun. It's the same sun. So that's the Vart. And listen, Vart means idea, word in Yiddish, literally. The idea here is that everyone has, there's the, when you talk about unity, human unity, or Jewish unity, you can speak on many different levels. Number one, we need each other. Number two, we're all puzzle pieces that are compatible with each other. Number three, those the deepest level. And that is, we're all one. N not, not in the body, but in soul. And the whole, again, the whole chapter 32 of Tanya is saying that the only way to truly ever reach a level of loving your fellow as yourself is only if you look at yourself as a soul. Because as long as you look at yourself as a body, you will never love anyone like yourself because you're not the same. How could I ever love you like me? I'm this, you're that, we're different. But if I see myself as a soul, and I therefore I see you as a soul, different. So the key here is, how do you look at yourself? Not how you look at the other person. How do you look at, when you look in the mirror, what do you see? Again, instead of speaking second or third person, let me speak of myself. When I look in the mirror, what do I see? Do I see a body or do I see a soul? It's easier to see a body than a soul. That takes work. But that's why we're here, right? That's why we study. We study to get a deeper perspective on reality. Certainly that's why we study the deeper teachings of Torah. So in the, bo the bottom line is Moses, in his final speech to the people, says, 
You're all standing here equally before the Lord your God. And what does that mean? When you remember God, you remember that you're one. When you forget about God in the soul, then you're different. Everyone's different and, and no one's comp- and everyone's fighting. You remember about God, there's compatibility. Now in compatibility, essential one is Donna. But even though we all have a piece of God, the soul, which is is all the same, but some, but the the way the manner in which our each person's animal soul manifests manifests more or less. Right. So how does that impact that we see everybody yes. the same? Good, good, good question. And I'll say even more so to to like um, to enhance your question. It's not only the animal soul is different. So number one, the body, everyone's body is different, obviously, right? No two people have the same DNA, fingerprints, etc. So the body is different. Uh, the way we think and feel are different. The animal soul's personality is different. Um, and the degree to which the godly soul is manifest within that individual construct is different within everybody. So there's a lot, there's a lot that divides us or there's a lot that differentiates us. So the question really is, do we let that divide us? And, and again, it goes back, it doesn't begin with how we see the other person. It always begins with how we see ourselves. It never starts with, you know, how do I look at the other guy? Do I look at them like a body or like a soul? Do I, do I judge them by their actions or who they really are inside? It never begins with them. It always begins with me. Do I value myself based on my accomplishments, based on, you know, the physical stuff, or do I value the spirit within me? When I value the spirit, the spirituality within me, then I can begin to be sensitive to their spirituality as well. And then I cut through all the other stuff. So yes, the body is different. The animal soul is different. The degree to which their soul is above the surface is different. But when I look at my core, when I look at myself at my core, I'll be more likely to look at the other one at their core. It's kind of like what we've spoken about in the past about faith. If we see God in the good stuff, then we'll see God in the, in the challenging stuff. When we don't see God in the good stuff, it's going to be hard to find God in those moments of crisis, right? And suddenly say, oh, let me have faith in God. Let me try to figure out how to have faith in God to get me through this. It's like when you train, and Muna is training, when we train ourselves to see God in those good moments, we can see God elsewhere. So when we train ourselves to look at ourselves, as a spiritual being, we're more likely. But yes, 100%, the animal soul is different. And, and that's a spiritual entity as well. And so there's a spiritual distinction, but that's not essential. In other words, the animal soul is a layer on top. This is what Tanya explains. We could say that animal soul, godly soul are parallels, but that's not the case. We're talking about core and then layers above the core. The core, and that's very important. The core is a godly soul. And on top of that, is a layer of animal soul and body and other stuff on top. So we all have the same core. It's like the, it's like the, what's it called? It's like the, um, the Ark of the Covenant that's made of three boxes, the gold, the wood, and the gold, right? So the gold, wood, and gold is really the banani. It's the Tanya's banani. It's at the core, the bottom layer, the, in, the, the bottom layer, bottom line is gold. Then above that is wood. So gold is precious and pure and wood is like, it could rot, it could, you know, and wood's also beautiful. It could be beautiful, but it could also go, you know, not so beautiful. And then on top of that is gold. So at the core is gold always. Then above that is complicated. And the idea, the ideal is that our behavior should reflect our inside, which is pure and perfect. The bottom line though here is about perception. How do we perceive ourselves? How we perceive the other? So Moses tries to get us to embrace this idea of unity. I should also mention that it, according to the Hasidic masters, well, hold on. According to everybody, this Torah portion is always read on the Shabbat before, the week before Rosh Hashanah. And what happens on Rosh Hashanah? We know it as Yom Hadin, the Day of Judgment. Now, the way we understand Day of Judgment is different than the Day of Judgment in, um, you know, the Hasidic understanding of judgment is different than perhaps the, 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 the broader understanding of judgment. It's less scary, more about you know, um, uh, uh, introspection to lead to growth, et cetera, as opposed to like scary, like doom and gloom type, type judgment. 
be that as it may, um, this Torah portion is always read before Rosh Hashanah. Because in Rosh Hashanah, no matter who we are, we're all together standing in judgment. In other words, it's the day of judgment for everybody. So God treats us equally. We're supposed to look at ourselves on a soul level, not on a body level. Look, looking a little bit deeper. There's also this other idea of, okay, I'm going to share with you another idea now. Okay, I'm going to pull the verse back up online so you can see what I'm talking about in this opening verse. It says, you are, you are all standing this day before the Lord your God. I forget who said this. It might have been the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of, of uh, the Hasidic movement, or the Magad of Mizrich, the second leader of the Hasidic movement. But one of them said the following. There's a tradition that every month before Rosh Chodesh, you bless the new moon or you bless the month by, um, you don't bless the moon, but you, you say a prayer evoking the time that Rosh Chodesh, the first of the month, is going to be that following week. I feel like I'm not expressing this clearly, but let me just say this uh, as, as clearly as I can. So let's say the new Jewish month begins on, on a Monday. So the Shabbat before, you would say, especially add a special prayer to the right before the Musaf uh, prayer, Shabbat after Shabbat morning, early afternoon. You would add a special few paragraphs that talk about God, bless, thanking God for creating the moon and creating the, the month and giving us whatever renewal, all that stuff. And we mention in synagogue when the new moon will be born, so to speak, when it in Jerusalem, when it first appears. And, um, because we have this now, it used to be back in the day, it was done by visual sight, and they went to the court, witnesses went to the court, and the court said, yes, Shkodesh. but now we have a calendar, we don't have a Sanhedrin, so we have, we all do this by the calendar. And we mentioned this, and we publicly bless the new month, or ask God to bless the new month. But here's the thing, the Shabbat before Rosh Hashanah, before Tishrei, we don't do it. The Shabbat, we don't do the blessing of the, of the new month. And it says, the Hasidic masters say, why not? Because instead of us blessing the new month, God gives us a blessing without us even having to ask for it. It comes unilaterally from above without us needing to be the ones to stir it from above, from below. So sometimes you need us to inspire God for the blessing. Sometimes it comes on its own. So I think it's the, it's the Bashem of the Magad who says, that what's the blessing? The opening verse. Today, you are all standing before God. Standing means standing upright with confidence. And what is Hayom? What is this day? What is today? In this understanding, it's referring to Rosh Hashanah, the day of judgment. And the blessing that God gives us is that in Rosh Hashanah, we should all stand with confidence and with positivity, knowing that God is going to give us a good year. So that's the blessing that's alluded to in this opening verse from a Hasidic perspective. Mark. Going back, uh, logically, it seems that if Sadiq would have, if not the larger scale, the shorter scale. So Mark is asking what I said before about everyone has a piece of God inside equally. So Mark is saying, but what about a Tzadik? Especially the Tzadik, according to Tanya, doesn't the Tzadik have either a bigger soul or a pure soul. So the, the, the way Tanya defines tzaddik is less about the godly soul and more about the obstruction of the animal soul. So whereas everyone else has the godly soul, but also an equally powerful animal soul that, that, that tries to take over the body and direct the body elsewhere other than where the godly soul wants to, wants to go. The tzaddik doesn't have the other side, either because it's gone completely, like no more. That's called the tzaddik gum or a complete tzaddik, which is extremely rare. Or in most cases of a tzaddik, although rare also, um, the animal soul is laying dormant, is kind of hibernating and not offering its ideas. I will say, so what that means is essentially that the, the distinction is less in the godly soul and more in the, the opposition, how loud or not loud or absent that side is. 
I will say just just if you want to focus on Tanya and the experience of what a tzaddik, like what does it feel like to be a tzaddik and to not have that other voice? We're all a tzaddik in certain areas. There are certain areas in which you, which every individual has no temptation. Where, and you know that other people are tempted in that area, but it's for you, it's not a thing. So in that one area, you're a tzaddik. Now, maybe not a complete tzaddik. Never, don't, don't tempt fate too much. Don't like go, get too close either. But there's certain areas in which, yeah, I don't, I don't want to do that. I know other people have, um, uh, you know, they, 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 they fail or they fall or they trip up in that area. But me, that doesn't, that doesn't, that, that's not my vice. Per good, perfect. In that area, we're tzaddik like. Tzaddik though is across the board, which is obviously why a tzaddik is, you know, gets gets paid the big bucks. I'm kidding, not about paying the big bucks, but it's like that's why a tzaddik is a tzaddik. But it's more about the opposition than about the soul. But with that being said, it says that Sadik does have additional spiritual powers. So there is something there. But at the core level, it's the same. Same sun. We'll leave it like that. <laughs> Rabbi, that. Did we, I think we studied a bit last week that, I mean, if you just, if the, you know, if a bad thing, you're not interested in it for your only because it doesn't, you know, speak to you. That's not the same as, you know, being like into desirous of it, but you're making the conscious effort to be right. a more elevated. Correct. Correct. There's two experiences. One is where you're not tempted by it. Right. So stay away from it. And the other one is you are tempted by it and you have to work really hard to, to repel it. So most of us are in category b for most things where we do feel temptation we do feel like that's the animal soul it's not there's nothing wrong with us by the way it's literally a, a, a the the desire that god wired us with that doesn't mean that well therefore the go for it. it but it means that the desire itself is to be expected our job is to work with that and push back against that and and keep it at bay but the fact that we're drawn toward it is natural and our job is to repel it. But there are areas, there are areas of temptation that individually you and I might not be tempted in. And that's good. That's a good thing. We should work on more of those areas, right? We should work on cultivating more of those if possible. But never expect, this is one thing that, that the author writes in Tanya again and again and again, very powerfully. Don't expect to be at Sabbath. Like, don't be surprised that you're that you get drawn towards something that's unholy and don't judge yourself like oh man i must be such a mess up like oh, i'm so flawed I'm... take it easy you're human like don't 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 give yourself too much credit don't give yourself that much credit if you were at sadik and had these thoughts you would have to wonder why but you're abandoning you're struggling abandoning that means you're an aspiring man you're trying to like anyway life is lived in the trenches Life is lived in that space of the tug of war between, or as the author of Rights in Tanya, the wrestler, the wrestling match of the animal soul and the godly soul. And yeah, we're stuck in the middle, but hopefully we can help shift the tide toward the right thing. But either way, we have this godly soul inside, and we need to, once we see ourselves in that way, it gives us more confidence. It gives us more strength to overcome. And it also helps us see the other person in a completely different light and helps us fulfill the mitzvah of loving our fellow as ourselves. Let's get to this third verse. Listen, the way it works is the, the less, the, the fewer amount of verses, the deeper we go in the, in the text. So that's it. But you think we're three verses will be done in three minutes? Are you kidding me? Not in DPP. All right, let's, uh, let's jump into the third verse, verse 11 here, Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 11. Um, so Moses says, you're all standing here together as one that you may enter. So this is the specific context of Moses' conversation, that you may enter the covenant of the Lord your God. We spoke about this last week a bunch of times, the covenant. And I mentioned, by the way, parenthetically, the third covenant. I just want to be clear here. It's not like God changed his mind, has a different covenant. It's really three iterations of the same covenant. God initially promises Abraham that we're, you know, we're tight. Me and you and your descendants, we're, all, we're in this together. At Sinai, it's reiterated. And once again, here it's reiterated. It's not a new covenant. It's, it's more of a renewal of the same covenant. So, and what is it? Why are we standing here today? That you may enter the covenant of the Lord your God and his oath 
which the Lord your God is making with you this day. So God, there's going to be a covenant and an oath that is happening this day. And this day, at this point, this is referring to the last day of the life of Moses. This is, this is the day. Um, let's continue to the second reading. After, after that conversation, second reading. So if, you, if you're here in person, just turn to that second page, starting with verse number, verse number 12. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 12. In order to establish you this day as his people. So if you stand here today and enter the covenant and the oath, etc., then this will help establish you this day as his people. And that he will be your God. He's talking about renewing the vows. You'll be his people. In other words, you're, you're pledging allegiance to him, to God. God is pledging allegiance to you. As he spoke to you, that's referring to Sinai, and as he swore to your forefathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So we have, again, this is the third renewal or the third iteration, if you will, of this covenant. The original was to the patriarchs, then Sinai, now on this day, once again, the covenant is being renewed. Let's see. Um, second. There's some interesting Rashi's here. Unfortunately, I don't have the Rashi's printed out. My apologies. Um, I, I want to focus on the, the Rashi, on the phrase um, that you're going to be established today as his people and that he will be your God. Take a look at that Rashi, if you have it. Second Rashi of this reading. Uh, verse number 12. Since God has given you his word and also sworn to your forefathers not to exchange their offspring for another nation. Look at that. Not to exchange their offspring for another nation. Therefore, he ensures your faithfulness to him by binding you through these oaths so as not to provoke him to anger because he cannot separate himself from you. So interesting. So interesting. In other words, God is promising not to ever sell out the Jewish people. Yes, we may be exiled from our land and lose the temple, but God is never going to say, you know what, forget it. Let me, let me choose someone else. Let me get another nation on board with this because the Jewish people, they're done. No, and, and, and you should know this is, this is obviously a Jewish commentary. So yeah, maybe it's, uh, there's bias, but yes, obviously. Um, but this has always been the Jewish perspective that there's no, there's no other. Um, God does not, God does not have a, you know, exchange of Jewish people as opposed to what, uh, what others perhaps had have said throughout the years. Okay. Um, okay. I want to re continue reading this Rashi. He says the homiletic explanation is as follows. Why is this Torah portion of Nitzavim juxtaposed to the curses of last week? So Rashi answers, because when Israel heard these 98 curses from last week, besides the 49 curses from Leviticus, they turned pale and they said, who can possibly endure these? Thereupon Moses began to appease them as follows. Moses begins this Torah portion by saying, no, you are standing this day. You have provoked the omnipresent to anger many times, yet he has not made an end to you. So in other words, you might think from last week's Torah portion and from Leviticus with the curses, you might think that the moment you do something wrong, zap, you're done for, you're finished. So Moses says, nah, you guys have already crossed the line multiple times. And you know what? You're still standing here. Yeah, it's okay. God will get over it. In other words, yeah, the curses are the curses, but you know what? You've made it until now. You're good to go. Indeed, I mean, I'm, this is literally what Rashi is saying from the, from the Midrash. Indeed, you still exist before him. Standing before the Lord. Um, this day, Rashi says, you exist now, just as this day exists. For although it becomes dark for a period, nevertheless, it shines again. That's a beautiful imagery. I love that. What does it mean, Hayom, this day? Just like day. There's even a song that someone wrote. The sun will come out tomorrow. Let bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow there'll be. Sun, light, 
Who knows the lyrics? Who knows? Number one, who knows the lyrics? Number two, who knows how to sing it? But anyway, here's the point. The point is that even after the darkness of night, the day brings light. So that's what Moses is saying. So too here, God has made light for you. And he will again make light for you in the future. In other words, even if the interim, there will be darkness. So it's light now. It's light today. Moses, Israel, Mishkan, temple, you know, it's, it's going to be good for a little while. Even when it gets dark, it'll get light again. And the curses and sufferings pre, uh, preserve you and enable you to stand before him. Look at that. It says the curses and sufferings preserve you you to enable you to stand before him the curse is by preventing you to stray from serving him and the sufferings by cleansing you of your sins okay similar in the previous parish of kitava moses spoke of, con of conciliation you've seen all the lord did okay another interpretation we have multiple interpretations here of the opening of, of the opening verse atom nitzam rashi here says because the israelites were now passing from one leader to the next from Moses to Joshua. Therefore, Moses made them stand in assembled ranks in order to encourage them. Joshua did the same when he was about to die. Also, Samuel did the same when Israel passed from his leadership to that of Saul. As he says, stand now and I will reason with you before the Lord. So and this idea of, of gathering everyone together and calling them forth, so to speak, into action is something that's done typically in Jewish history when one leader was passing the mantle of leadership to the other, kind of like saying, you guys are now, or maybe <laughs> says to the, to the leader, you're now in charge of these guys. Take a good look. <laughs> it's, it's like when you become a counselor in, in camp, right? The first day of camp. And you're like, okay, this is your bunk. You guys are going to the park. Make sure they all come back, right? Like, just <laughs> take account. These are your 11, 12 kids in your bunk. Their responsibility, done. Uh, the king is dead long live the king. Yeah, why? Because the new king. Yeah. 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 Good. The British were onto something. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, complicated that, that royal family. Can we just say that? Is that is that safe to say? Complicated? Yeah. I guess everyone's complicated. Yeah. It's like the royals. They're dressed like us. Okay. Next. Deuteronomy chapter 29, 13. Just maybe, you know, better clothing. Here we go. But not only. Oh, listen to this. You're going to love this verse. If you loved everything else in Torah up until now, you're going to love this one. But not only with you am I making this covenant and this oath, but with those standing with us here today, sorry, but with those standing here with us today before the Lord, our God, and also with those who are not here with us this day you know who that means that's you and i baby that's us that's us right here right now august 30th 2021 studying this torah portion moses says we're make we're renewing the covenant and who's the covenant with it's between you guys and god and who's the you guys who's the y'all it's all y'all it's those yeah we all y'all this it's you guys that are here today it's the ones that are standing right here before God. And it's also those that are not standing here before God. In other words, all those who are yet to be born. Yeah, yeah. It's about those that are not yet born. Let's see Rashi. Rashi says, those who are not here, also with future generations. That means that you and I are in the covenant. We have pledged our allegiance to God. God has pledged our allegiance to us. Yes, you say, well, I didn't opt in. Dude, bro, what's the female version? I don't know. Whatever. I'm, maybe it's not gender specific. It's like, huh? I don't know. It's like, hey, maybe hey works. Everyone's opted in, right? I didn't opt in. I never checked that box. You're opted in. Moses opted us all because he's Moses. He can do the, he can do the opt-in. He's got like back end control. He can, he can do this. He opted us all in to this covenant. So we're in, can't get out, right? We're in the covenant. A soul is a soul. A Jew is a Jew. Ain't getting out. No escape. No, it's not as foreboding as it sounds. But the bottom line is we're, we're in it to win it. 
All right, so that's, yes. Yeah. Tanchum is a midrash. Mm. So it's referring therefore to future generations, yeah. right? Right. So, so the the understanding. How do we know that it's referring to future generations? Because Moses says the covenant is made with those that are here today and those that are not here today. So you might think, well, maybe some people are schluffing back in the tents. Maybe you know Moses gathered like fifty people and he's saying, "Hey, we're all in this. You guys, you fifty plus everyone else that's still you know." You know, at the park playing tennis, the desert sand clay court, sand lot ball. There you go, right? Playing stick ball in the with the dunes there with the who knows? No, everyone was there. At them needs some my yom kuchem. Every single one was there. So when Moses says we're making the covenant with those that are here and those that are not here, it's not referring to Yankel, who's still sleeping in the tent, because all the Yankels. And you know who you are. No, I'm kidding. All the Yankles were there. So there's no other Yankle. That there is a future Yankle. And yes, future Yankle, this message is for you. You are in the covenant. That's the message. God is with you. God is pledging and promising to be with you through thick and thin. Even when it's dark, if there will be light again, it will get the next day or whatever. The sun will shine. The sun will rise. Not, not Don't be despondent. But also, it's a message of commitment on our end to God. All right, I think that is it. We went pretty. One second, let me toggle Rashi off. Um, I feel like we did it. It's pretty in depth as far as understanding a, a bunch of different ways of, of understanding. I think with this first verse of Atim Nitzavim, the opening of the verse of the Torah portion, I think we had like four or five different ways of understanding it. Number one, it's referring to Rosh Hashanah. Number two, it's referring to Jewish unity. Number three, it's referring to Moses kind of consoling the people after the curses. Don't worry, you're still here. You'll still be here. Um, we also spoke about a missing one. All right, whatever it is. And then the, the core of this is the idea of this covenant, of this renewal of the covenant, of being a pledging our allegiance to God and God pledge, pledging his allegiance to us. And I guess I, I'll conclude formally. I mean, we'll, we'll open up the discussion, but my final word will be about Rosh Hashanah. And Rosh Hashanah, it, it's, it's not a good, it's not a smart move to stand before God as an individual and say, God, look at me. Look at me. Look at what I've done this past year. Renew my, you know, renew my contract for another year. I don't know. Does anyone want to stand up full scrutiny before God? I, it's not, I, I don't think it's a good move. The best move is you stand with a bunch of people. It's like, let me give you the old school analogy. I love the school analogy, right? What's more effective for one person to protest or for the whole class, to pro one student to protest or the whole class to protest? Whole class. Yes, because what, what's, the, what's the, or like the whole school. Imagine if like the whole school, pro one guy protests, I'm not coming to class, whatever it is. All right, then you're, you're done, you're out. The whole school sits out to protest something. The administration is going to listen. We stand. We're. Am I wrong here? I don't think. I don't think I'm. I'm, no, I'm, not, right. saying, I'm not calling for school upheaval and whatever. <laughs> at least not right now. Well, anyway, no. The point is, I'm not calling for any uh, movement necessarily. My point is, we're stronger together. Think okay. about it in the context of a rope. One strand can be cut easily, but a thick rope. Imagine one strand of. I don't know, whatever the thing is, right? You cut it with the scissors, no big deal. Huh? A tightrope. How many strands does a tightrope have? A lot. Yes. It's got to be more than one. <laughs> that would be yes. awkward. Yes. One. Yes. But imagine a strand that's comprised of six, imagine a rope, sorry, that's comprised of 600,000 strands or millions of strands, more, more appropriate, more accurately. Millions of strands. That rope is not easily set. So Rosh Hashanah, let's remember this. It's, it's a week from tonight. At them, it's I know, right? <laughs> you getting the heebie jeebies. I know, no, I mean, no, in a good way, but yeah, Rosh Hashanah is coming up. At them, hayom Our strength lies in the fact that we stand together. So, on Rosh Hashanah, let's open our hearts not just to God, but to each other. Let's create more space in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds 
thinking about the other, standing consciously and emotionally with the other person, with, with, our, with the community, with the world. And with this, God will say, I'm going to bless you all. We say this every three times a day, at least three times a day in the Amida. We say in the Sim Shalom, in the prayer, in the, in the paragraph of the prayer of peace, we say, Barcheno Avinu, bless us our Father, Kulano Ke'echad, all as one. And there's the simple way of understanding it and the deeper way. Simple way is, we're saying, God bless us all. The deeper understanding is that we're saying, when are you going to bless us? It's when we're all as one. When we stand together as one, then we're more likely to merit a blessing for us all. A parent loves when the kids get along. When the kids get along, the parent will, will do anything and give her anything. The kids are at each other's, you know, the kids are not getting along. Different dynamic, different dynamic. Then it's like, you know, I don't know. I don't think we're going to, I don't think we're going to go to Target today and get you guys some, some, uh, some stuff. No, it's too much fighting. Not, I'm not uh, giving parenting tips right now. I'm just saying there's more of a likely scenario. I took my kids to Target yesterday, just so you know. They were all getting along very nicely. And the point is like this, that um, we need to get along, realizing that we're all in the same boat. We complement each other, and we share the same DNA, essential core DNA. So less fighting, more loving, less hating, more embracing, and... Uh, with this, we should be blessed with a, with a good year. The traditional blessing is the Shana Tova, Masuka. It should be a good year and a sweet year. Good is good. Sweet is even better. We like sweet. Sweet's good. I mean, would we mind if it's like, you know, a very complex flavor? It's also, it's also good. But sometimes too sophisticated is too sophisticated. Keep it simple. Keep it sweet. Keep it easy. We'll have to save the honey insights Oh, uh, Donna, did you share honey insights over the weekend, Ali Mood? Or was that or was that at the JLI retreat? That was at the JLI. So Donna, <laughs> if you don't mind, take us home to the conclusion with one insight, one honey insight. One, honey, one, one honey insight. One honey insight. Well, I actually, what's fresh in my mind now is the nature, because that's what I spoke about in my Torah class. And you know, Isaac, I learned was is is given credit for creating the afternoon service yes and what that's something i shared i learned and shared so and when he did that because he wanted to be and he wanted to be outside in the daylight to be closer to the heavens and hashem right outside in the fields yes that is great. and i guess we can think so that i mean the tie perhaps to the holidays maybe it's tashlik you know when we're outside yes. and we cast away and the rivers and waters take everything away. Beautiful, beautiful. And I'll also mention, thank you for sharing that. And, and as a plug, as a quick commercial announcement, just announcing now, we've well, made the decision last week, I may have mentioned it already, the learner service that I do will be taking place outdoors just because a lot of people have been asking. We're doing it outdoors so that we'll have the most comfort. Please, God, we have the sh not, um, not shelters. We have um, canopies. Thank you. Canopies are already set up, and please God, we'll arrange global air conditioning to make sure that the temperature is nice and cool. Working on that, but please God, it's going to be a nice, comfortable, safe, and secure environment outdoors. So join us for that. But yeah, do you know when the, where the dinner is being held? The pre Young Kipper dinner. I don't know. I don't know about dinner tonight. Let alone dinner or free. I'm Kipper. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm just fooling around. No, I'm not sure. I, that may or may not have been decided already, uh, but I'm not, I'm not sure. I can find out though. Um, okay, a few quick announcements. So number one, um, we've had to postpone the chauffeur factory. Uh -huh. So for those that were thinking about coming out tonight, yes, don't don't come out for the chauffeur factory because we had to postpone it. Um, it may be postponed until next year, just given the the, the, the the dates on it. We weren't able to do it, unfortunately. Um, kind of a last minute thing. Um, that is Chauffeur Factory. Tomorrow night, though, is our second session of 60 days. Wednesday night, we begin High Holiday Boot Camp, both in person and online. Um, so get spiritually ready for the holidays. That's going to be a really, really special class on Rosh Hashanah, uh, we'll do a class on Rosh Hashanah, one on Yom Kippur and one on Sukkot for all three holidays. 
the class in Rosh Hashanah is called canceling the culture of cancel culture, which I think is great. But if somebody cancels cancel culture, are they also cancel culture? Aha, that, aha, that's the meta mind blowing inception of this high holiday boot camp, which we will find out Wednesday night. Um, what other announcements? We have the learner service coming up. So really the focus is now holidays, but I will just to drop a few things. We have a, some really exciting things going on um, uh, right around and after the holidays or part of the holiday experience, including we're doing a sushi in the sukkah where we're gonna be making sushi and eating sushi. So there's sushi, there's sushi eating, sushi making, live sushi bar with live sushi chefs. It's gonna be an amazing experience. That's how we roll, yes. Oof. I'm not even gonna take the credit for that. Mark, I'm blaming you for that. But I, blaming means I love that. Um, all right, and I think we'll conclude today with a chauffeur sounding. Does that sound good? Okay. Yes. All right. Give me a second. Let's let's see if the chauffeur's still here. Should be. Last time I checked. Yeah. Oh, we go. Hidden behind some layers of. Okay, we're a week away. I have to get ready for this because I sound the chauffeur at our learner service. So, oh, oh, and I also should mention we're going to start doing a monthly Shabbat learner service once oh, a month, the second Shabbat of every month. We're going to be doing a uh, kind of a more interactive um, learner service on Shabbat. So stay tuned for more Saturday mornings. Yeah. So it should be fun. Okay, here we go. Here goes none. Every, every time we do it throughout this month, it gets uh, a nice sound to it today. Mm. Uh, so interesting. Good question. Um, the chauffeur is, I don't, I don't, oh, I should know this. I don't know that you have to say like the shame, you have to say a special blessing or prayer before you do it. When you make matzah, you do. Um, when you write a Torah scroll, mezuzah, tefillin, you do. Is there a reason that the Torah, Torah is open? The Torah doors? Oh, no. 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 Should, here, let me show you something. It's not actually open. I mean, it is kind of open, but we have this. The, oh. the door is behind. They lock it. Yeah, you have to lock it. That way you have a safer Torah. Oh, very cute. <laughs> safer Torah means Torah oh. scroll. Yeah, that was, yes. that was it. That was right. the, what's the lowest point? The na Nader? Na how do you pronounce that? Nader. Nader? Like Ralph? I believe Nader. Nader? Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was like the lowest point of, of the jokes. That was it. I, it's only only up from here. Uh, but yeah, no, it's just, we, yeah, we usually close it throughout the week. But. I mean, it's pretty. It's nice either way. I was just wondering if it was a special. Actually, either way is really nice. Yeah. Oh, and you should know for the high holidays, we switch out. This is a Jewish, uh, uh, classic Jewish custom. It's white, white, white. Oh, the other colors for white. White. Because yeah, white, uh, like, you know, high holidays, white, you know, we, we wear white typically. Uh, 
Um, yeah. Perfect. That's right. No kill for no service. It's a, it really is a beautiful, I will say this. I mean, I, I didn't make it, I can't take credit for it, but it really is a beautiful uh, park. One thing that drives me nuts, I feel like the angle, I don't know if you guys can see this, I feel like there should be one, like a little bit of a, you know what I'm talking about, right? There should be like a little bit of a thing. No, there's too much of a space here. No, the pattern. The Beauty and the imperfections. Beauty and the imperfections. Beauty and the imperfections, exactly. All right. Thank you guys for joining. We'll see you, I guess, tomorrow. Same bad time, same bad channel. We'll see you. Thank All you, right. Emma. And we'll hear from Sandrine, hopefully, how her New York one-day trip. She's coming back tonight. Yeah, Sandrine was broadcasting live. Well, just for a few minutes from Crown Heights. She's in, uh, she's going, she went, flew in this morning for Rosh Hashanah, before Rosh Hashanah. She should have invited us all to come. I know. Well, listen, it's next year. Hopefully, we'll do a big trip with everybody. Yes. Next year, please God. This year, still a little bit, you know, everything's a little touch and go with stuff, but I feel like next year with good health and good health, we'll all be there. I would love to go with you guys, hit some restaurants. Hit the, the big synagogue in Crown Heights. Check out the Judaica stuff. Hit some more restaurants. Go to the Rebbe's <laughs> Oho, Rebbe's uh, resting place. Yes. You don't think? No. I'm, I'm hoping. I'm hoping we get some, 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 uh, some positivity. Yes. Right. Maybe that's the question. All right. Well, let's, let's officially, we'll close out, then we'll schmooze more. All right. We'll see you guys. Take care. All right. Just like